Again, it's good to have our visitors with us. We're glad that you're here. We hope this service is a help and a blessing to you. Um, I did talk with the radio group again about the market that we're being offered in San Francisco. And uh, more to come on that. I've still got a few more questions for him. We talked at length today, emailed yesterday, and they're offering at a actually a very good price. I don't know where Jerry Jordan is. he even here right now? Oh, he's ushering out there. Um, a, a Monday through Friday slot at 10 a.m. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, and what's going on with it, it's, it, there's other opportunities with it as well. The group that's offering this to us is one of the largest in the nation for Christian radio stations, uh, preaching ones, talk Christian radio, conservative news, and financial. And uh, um, so, but I still got a few more questions before I present it before the church, but, uh, um, and, uh, but it looks like it's, uh, they're going to be very competitive with us to get us into the market. They knew who, who we are and what size we are. And uh, so they're, they're probably looking around, wherever Jerry is, he's out there listening right now. They're probably looking right around 800 a month uh, for that price right there for that. So anyhow, but we'll, we'll be talking more about that. It's the fourth largest market in the nation. Um, and it's a tremendous opportunity also with the radio group that is bringing us in. They're in markets all over the place. Um, so it's interesting. And uh, so anyhow, Acts chapter 6 tonight, though, starting in verse number 8. Acts chapter 6, verse number 8, down through the end of the chapter. This is certainly one of those messages that I, I enjoy studying for all of them. There's never one where I finish studying and I'm like, that was boring. That, that, just, <laughs> that just hasn't happened. But there's others that really grab you, and this is certainly one of them. Uh, but Acts chapter 6, verse number 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suburned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. That would be the Sanhedrin. And set up false witnesses. Does all this sound familiar as we just went through the Gospel of Matthew? said, this man seetheth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Now get this. And all they that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And then he is going to preach. And that sermon will end in his death. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the message tonight. Lord, number one, I pray that you be glorified and honored by all that's said and done. Lord, control what I say and how I say it. May it help us, may it draw us closer to you. Lord, please change us and draw us, draw us Lord. You know what needs to be done in each and every heart. Lord, I pray that you would do just that. Lord, may we leave here different than when we walked in. Please bless and work, Lord. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. When we started chapter 6 last week, we saw a division had come into the church. The devil has tried several different avenues to disrupt what is taking place. This is still the only church in existence. That's it. Just the church at Jerusalem. He's tried persecution. He's tried bringing a sin into the church with Ananias and Sapphira. And now he went the way of division. And it was, it was the division between the Hellenistic Jews and, and those who grew up in Israel, the Hebrew Jews, with their widows. And they thought there's partiality taking place against the Hellenistic Jews, against the Grecians. Those who did not grow up in Jerusalem but traveled to Jerusalem and thus they don't even speak Hebrew. Uh, many of them would not. They would speak Greek or whatever language they were from. 
And so to settle that, the apostles, they use great wisdom. They say, listen, these disputes like this, we have to stay in the word of God and in prayer. And we talked about that last time. They said, now look out among, you know, seven men full of faith, full of wisdom. And, and so they, they found these men and they were to settle the issue. And we stressed how what I loved about it was the wisdom that the church used in selecting it. And the apostles agreed by appointing them. Every single man they chose was a Grecian. It was a Hellenistic Jew. We know by their names. All their names are Greek names. Incredible. And it worked. And so now, though, we learn now about the very first man they selected, Stephen. It's not just random that his name is mentioned first. He is an incredible man. I have no doubt, I believe, though, that that church knew immediately Stephen is going to be one of these men. He was not an apostle, he was a servant. He was not a prophet, but he certainly was a preacher. He had great power and a miracle worker, even though, again, not an apostle. Stephen is a man we need to learn about. He is much of what we need today. He is an example. He is a man that did not wait for a position to serve God. He was already serving God. He served God however he could with what he had. Understand this, when he got appointed by the apostles, that's not what changed him. They already knew who he was. And the Lord certainly knew him. He was a man who, after he was converted, whenever that was in the short lifespan of the church, remember, there, there's, we're probably going on close to 20,000 now that are members at the church in Jerusalem. This was a man, though, after he was conversion, his life was all about God. He cared not for his own life, as we're going to see. Because again, as I've already mentioned, at the conclusion of this sermon, he's getting ready to preach to the Sanhedrin. He's going to be executed. We're going to learn about this incredible man and his very, very short ministry. And we're going to learn that being effective and influential in life is not about longevity. It's about having God's blessing. The death of Stephen, this is interesting. Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death of Stephen is the longest account in Scripture of any man. What the Lord is going to use Stephen to do, really, is going to launch the church into the world in a way that it has not seen it. We have one church in existence that's getting ready to change. He is going to be the trigger that fires all this out. We have the saying in America, the shot heard around the world. His death is going to be the shot heard around the world. There's a book that was given to me, I think, shortly after I got here by Jim Farr. I did not read it. Um, I think it was called God's Navy Seal or something along those lines. And I heard it's a good book. I don't know, like I said, I haven't read it. But about a Christian who served in the Navy Seals. I'm going to be honest, the real Navy SEAL here is Stephen. See, it's not about about serving for uh, um, political governments. It's about giving your life for God, that cause. This was a man who recognized that, and that's what he gave his life for. This is what he was living for. He was unique in this position because of where he was raised. It was not in Israel. This was a man who wanted to be used of God in a special way, just like those who desire to be a a Navy SEAL. But this man wanted to be used in a special way from God. It's about giving our energy and life for the Lord. We're going to look at, I have this broken down into three ways. We're going to focus on the second point, his faith, his fight, and his face. Let's first look at his faith tonight. Verse 5 and verse 8, our first verse of our text, verse 5 also stresses his faith. It says that Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. We come down to verse 8 and it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So let's look at this man of faith. Now, in the book of Acts, as we're going through the book, verse 8 is marking a change. 
Stephen is a bridge. He's transitional. What we're going to see taking place now in the book of Acts, we're going, to, we're going to have Stephen here taking place in chapter 6, chapter 7. Chapter 8, we're going to be introduced to another one of those servants, Philip, who was selected. And then it changes the Apostle Paul. This is the transition now going from Peter to Paul. <clears throat> it's funny because he's going to be appointed by Peter, as, as he is. And yet, he's going to be martyred by the hands of Paul. He will be the catalyst that launches the church and gets churches started in the world. It will be because of his martyrdom that persecution is launched and these 20,000 converts have to scatter. It's going to be responsible, really, when you think about it, for the book of James. His name means victor's crown. It's so fitting considering his death. He is a Jew but brought up outside of Israel. This is going to be the exact same group that he sees as his mission field. While the apostles were Galileans, even called unlearned and ignorant men, but everybody knew they spent time with Christ. They could not believe the wisdom they spoke with. But this would not have been true of Stephen in regards to education. It's very likely he was well educated. Cultured. Stephen is a man from a different world than what the apostles were. Much like the apostle Paul. Again, described as a man full of faith. It means filled up. It means this, this is the emotion. This is what dominates you. For instance, when we say a man is filled with rage, that's his controlling emotion. When a, when a man is filled with anger, we understand that's his controlling emotion. Or filled with joy or filled with love. But this is a man who is filled with faith. It's what dominates his life. So when we see Stephen, we see a man of faith. And we know from Genesis to Revelation, God always responds to faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. We know from what he preached, his belief, his strong belief in the Old Testament, his strong belief in Jesus Christ, of course, as the Messiah, the resurrection. The Bible tells us here that he was full of power as well. This is, of course, related to him being full of the Holy Ghost. They go hand in hand. They're to wait in Jerusalem until they be endowed and endued with power from on high. The man had the hand of God on his life. He did great wonders, the Bible says, and miracles among the people. Keep in mind, before he was appointed to this position, he's just a layman who got converted. But he was full of faith. His power would prove, just like with the apostle, just like the apostles, it would authenticate his message that he is preaching. Now let's go on to his fight. Verses 9 through 14. It says, Then there was certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of uh, Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suburned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They stirred up the people and the elders, and the scribes came upon him, and they caught him and brought him to the council. They set up false witnesses, which said, This man seeth us not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. It's so much so similar to the trial of Jesus Christ. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Let's stop there. Now, they're going to be so furious here, and I'm going to get to that. They're not, they're not even going to bring him to the Roman government. They're going to execute him on the spot. 
So what we have here taking place in verse 9, Stephen heads into the fight. He's heading into one of the synagogues here in Jerusalem. Now, keep in mind, in Jerusalem at this time, historians tell us there's about 500 synagogues just in the city of Jerusalem. The, one of the reasons why there's so many synagogues is because uh, of the Hellenistic Jews that lived outside of Israel. They would come in, they would need to identify with a place that spoke their own language, and all you needed to do was have tin to establish a synagogue. So synagogues were getting established that were, that were uh, as a result of all the, those in the nation of Israel living outside, Jews living outside of Israel coming in. So many of the synagogues in Jerusalem arose meeting that need. Those of the same language. Stephen heads to one of these. So let's look at the group, though, that he comes across. Now, it's debated whether what we're seeing here, if this was actually one synagogue, or we had one to three right in the exact same area. Because the Alexandrians throw, because they would probably speak a little bit different language. But anyhow, the groups, here's who's, here who is present, and this is important. You're going to see why we get to one of these groups. Stephen heads off. He heads to this synagogue or a possible area of, of two to three synagogues together, and he preaches. The libertines here are mentioned. Who are they? Well, it, really it is debated. The most, most common uh, uh, belief is that this is referring to a large number of Jews that were basically taken as slaves and prisoners of Rome going back to 63 B.C. And over time, they were sold off as slaves and, and things taking place, but most of them found their freedom of that group. And many even believe this is referring to that group and their offspring, their synagogue that was in Jerusalem. We have the Cyrene, Cyrenians here. This is a city in Africa by Libya. We have the Alexandrians from the capital of Egypt. At, at that time, the capital of Egypt, I should say. And then a very interesting group. Let me cover the last group. Those are on Asia. That's referring to the area of Ephesus. But we have those from Cilicia. I can't I can even hardly say it correctly. Uh, Cilicia and the Cilicians. They're present. This was a coastal province in the day, basically southern Turkey today is where it sits. The capital city of this province is what's interesting. It's Tarsus. Guess who's from Tarsus? The Apostle Paul. He is at the Apostle Paul's synagogue. That is no coincidence. Little does Stephen realize how important his sermon and his disputing is going to be because of a key man who is listening to him that is going to end up converted soon. The man who would be the instrument of getting the gospel to the entire world. The man who would be the instrument God would use to pin in two-thirds of the New Testament. You never know who is listening and who it is that your life is having an impact on. So you have these five groups that are here representing one to three synagogues that are present. And Stephen is there with them. So he goes there and he preaches. He is preaching, of course, that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. That's what the focus is. What the law was really about. How we see Christ throughout the Old Testament. Again, this is the group because he's part of them. He saw as his mission field. It's also interesting that in what he did here and going, of course, his life is cut short. Paul is going to follow suit. Whenever he traveled out, he always went to that synagogue first in the area. So as he's teaching and as he's preaching, there are those who come together to rise up against him and challenge him. They dispute with him. It's in this dispute that we're going to see his wisdom, his spirit, and his courage. Now, I want you to think about this. As they rise up to dispute, they hear him, and they interrupt him, basically. They hear him making the case that Jesus Christ 
is in fact the Messiah. They're, they're hearing him preach most likely in the Greek language right now. I believe the person who rose up to dispute against him would have been one of the leaders of the synagogue, Paul, who at this time is Saul. I think what took place this day, and for other reasons as well, that we have two brilliant minds going back and forth, Stephen and Saul, in front of multitudes, battling over divine truth, And the fact is, we know from the text, Stephen won. Stephen wasn't looking to win a debate. He he certainly, by what we know of the Apostle Paul and saw in his position, I don't think he was a, a better debater than Paul was. But what Stephen had was truth. How amazing would it have been to hear this take place? We don't know exactly what was debated. We we, we can surmise, of course, based on the charges that are brought against Stephen of what they were debating. The law, Jesus Christ, the sacrifices, a debate between the old covenant, the new covenant, the purpose of the law. It's a debate of salvation by grace. I mean, I can, I mean, when I was studying, I could just see Paul there as Stephen is debating with such confidence, with such clarity, as perhaps he's hearing for the very first time that no man is justified by the deeds of the law that would shake him to his core. He's hearing a man speak it with conviction, with persuasion, using the scriptures. And you know what the Bible says? even for the Apostle Paul who saw it this time, he cannot resist it. He's speaking with such wisdom. He's using the scriptures. He's hearing him speaking. You can just hear those words, how we are saved by grace through faith, that the purpose of the law is to bring us to the Messiah. It's not your means of salvation. And as I was going through, know what chapter came to mind? Romans chapter 7. As Paul deals with what was going on in his mind when he learned the purpose of the law. This is the first time he's hearing it. Right now. Incredible. He's hearing how Christ was the Lamb of God. Slain to take away the sins of the world. Stephen is no doubt demonstrating how all that was done in the temple prior was a shadow of the Messiah to come. Saul is hearing this. It has the ring of truth. He can't resist it. He's he's struggling for words and how to debate it. He's speaking with eloquence, with power. It's convicting. He hears this man speak. He could not resist the wisdom and the spirit in which he spoke. I mean, I could just see. Because this event here, he is moments from death right now. Stephen is. From a horrible death of being stoned. Saul, the apostle Paul, before his conversion, Saul, is going to give the authority to execute him. Could you imagine when Saul went home that night? Remember, one thing that's unique about Saul, and and I believe true of very few in leadership of the pseudo-Judaism that was established, but definitely true of some. You know what Saul wanted? Truth. Do you know when he hit home that night? I, I wonder if he just uttered to himself over and over, did you see his face? Did you see his face? Did you hear what he said? No man is justified by the deeds of the law. And in his mind, Paul had a brilliant mind. You know it makes sense. 
it's hitting him. It's hitting him now. He's getting ready to get converted on the road to Damascus. Paul was a man who wanted truth and he knows he's hearing truth. And also the way that Stephen spoke it. How he did it. Let's think about that for a second in relation to our day. He was a man of conviction as well as courage. He was a man of conviction. He truly believed what he was saying. He wasn't running through a sales pitch to get somebody to say some words. He was preaching with passion, with power, much like would take place in the life of the Apostle Paul. What's sad is in the day we live in, it's the agnostic, it's the atheist that are admired, not a man of conviction. The man who's admired in our culture today is the opposite of what the world needs. The world likes somebody, what they're going to call, just broad-minded. Just believe whatever. Well, if that's what you believe, that's good for you. If you believe and you're a a 50-year-old white male that you're a 24-year-old Asian female, good for you. What a bunch of nonsense. It's nonsense. Yes, but we want to be broad-minded. No, we want truth. We want to know what's right and what's wrong. We want to know what happens. Is this it? Is this all there is to life? Or are we created by Almighty God? What's true? It's not about being broad-minded. It's about finding truth. You know what Stephen knows? He found truth. It led to him, him being dogmatic. A man today of conviction and persuasion is almost seen as evil. How can you possibly believe your way is the only way? Sad, the broad-minded existentialist who can look at creation and not even recognize God is lifted up. Incredible. We need to believe what we believe and show it. Not pussyfoot around with it, not apologize for it. Listen, you can, when it comes to education, you can play around a little bit with art and with poetry, but when it comes to math, they're simply right and wrong answers. There's no gray areas. That's the same thing with Christianity and the Bible. It doesn't give room to play around with. Understand this, it is revelation, not speculation. It's not a guessing game. We live in a day of mass confusion as to what is right and wrong. Every man wanting to choose his own morality. We as Christians are to be people of conviction. And like Stephen, get this, you speak the truth in love as the Bible commands. It's not just, see Stephen, we have two problems. We have those who are scared to speak the truth. And those who just speak it to win it. Just to show I'm right. Notice what affected them was the wisdom that he spoke with and the spirit that he spoke with. How he presented it. What they knew was, he, again, like I've already said, he wasn't there, they knew, just to win a debate. What they realized, no, he really believes this. He really believes, I need this. They saw a man speaking truth in love. He desired to see them converted. They could not resist his spirit, how he spoke it with such confidence and with such love. Had he displayed arrogance and pride in it like happens way too much, it would have been easy for them to resist. But because of how he spoke it, it was matching the wisdom with what she spoke. It's going to lead to the conversion of the most important man of all of Christianity. With Stephen, we see this man of of conviction. See, he knew Christianity was not a puzzle to be solved. 
It's a reasonable faith to be believed. There are things out there that are not reasonable to believe in faith. And yet it's accepted as come. I assure you, when you understand this book, written over those 1,600 years, covering 4,000 years, the prophecies that are in it, how it has the answers to so much of what we see in the world as compared to the idea that there is no God and we just happen to be, that's unreasonable faith. It doesn't make any sense. I have news for you. I, I, I could care less what the leading atheists say. And I've listened to their arguments. Nothing does not create anything. That is absurd. That is not a reasonable faith. If Stephen was dogmatic and they could not argue against the spirit or the wisdom with what she with what he spoke. This was a man going right into the fight, right into the heart of it, with people he could relate with. He's right there by himself. That's God's Navy SEAL. He was a man of courage, we also see, because he is arrested as a result. He doesn't blink an eye. The fact is, when you hear truth, you either make him mad or glad. When they're hearing the truth, it makes them furious. Stephen is going to see a vicious response to the preaching of his truth. Yet he shows such, such courage all the way through death. You can still see his love in the end, praying, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. Yes, sir. It's incredible. Yes, sir. So, they hear his words. They want him arrested. So they suburn these men. It means to use collusion. They were going to hire false witnesses. They had to figure out how to get him out, how to get him arrested. So they stir the people up. Boy, governments can be great at stirring the people up to try and get what they want. They bring Stephen before the Sanhedrin. The charges are given, speaking against Moses, the law, the temple. Same charges brought before Jesus Christ. Yet you see nothing but courage in this man. And even though he's arrested, he's going to preach an amazing message that will probably take two Wednesdays to look at and demonstrating Jesus is the Messiah. Now, let's go to the last point, his face. We saw his faith, his fight, and now his face. Verse 15. And all they that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Here he is before the Sanhedrin. The chargers are being read. Remember, when they throw out that word to blaspheme, it carries the death penalty. But then they all begin to look steadfastly on him. They can't look away from the man. There's something about him. And they conclude they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now exactly what they saw, I don't know. But I know it was a wow moment for every single one of them because they couldn't look away. I don't necessarily think, as we see at different times in Scripture, with the brightness uh, of the face of an angel. I, I don't think it's talking about that. But let, let me, I think it's a possibility just because of this. The one way I can see the Lord doing that is because what happened when Moses came down from the mount? His face shone. I can see the small possibility of that referring to that, but I think it would have been more specific if that was it. But I could see it because here they are charging him for speaking against Moses when they might be looking at him saying, wait a second. He looks like Moses. But I think the appearance represented something of a pure holiness of an angel. 
No fear. A representative, a messenger of God. One commentator said this, let me quote him. Speaking of the Sanhedrin as they looked upon Stephen, in their minds, he looked like he has transcended above all of it. He looked as if he were pure and holy and virtuous. All of his power in the Holy Spirit, all of his wisdom in the Holy Spirit, all of his grace in the Holy Spirit, all of his faith, all of it came out on his face and he looked angelic. I think that's probably pretty close to what they were seeing. And they couldn't look away. It looked as the face of an angel. One, no doubt, of a fearlessness, a confidence in God, a sincerity, a pureness, a calmness. And here he is that's been arrested. They've heard him preach. And you, and you know who's there, of course, because we know he's going to give the authority for the execution. Is Saul. He's staring right at his face. He's remembering the words he spoke, how even Paul, one of the most brilliant minds in Judaism at that time, couldn't argue with him. And now he sees his face. It stops everything. The pause is going to open up to Stephen's reply because the high priest is going to say, what do you have to say? And he's going to preach. Stephen was a man full of faith. That led to him getting in the fight. So much so, even when tribulation and even facing death arose, his own life just didn't matter. The truth of God did. And because of the position he put himself in, that man standing there witnessing all this. Saul, you better believe this is going to lead to his conversion in Acts chapter 9. It's going to hit. It's going to hit. And the moment Christ knocks him, knocks him down on the road to Damascus, he doesn't hesitate. He puts his faith in Christ. That seed started right here. Started right here. Boy, do we need more like Stephen in our day. We have so much distracting us and pulling us that we want to give our energy. Listen, we all have a desire to be special at something. We do. The devil will take your mind on good things and neat things and this and that. It doesn't have to be worldly things and sinful things, although he would love to do that and destroy you completely. But he's fine if you just give your life to something that is vanity, of that desire to be special that's given by God. God desires to be special for him. Not for the kingdoms of this world. For him. All this is going to be dissolved one day. Life is all about God. Let's give it to him. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Now, this message, of course, certainly was for Christians, but let me ask this. Let me ask this. Maybe you're not certain if you are a Christian. What I mean by that is this. I want you, I want you to think about this. If you were to die right now, what would happen to you? Do you know for certain that if you were to die right now, that heaven is your home? You say, oh, yes, I've been baptized. I've joined a church. Listen, those are all good things, but none of those things will get you to heaven. I didn't ask you, if you when you got baptized. I didn't ask you if you joined a church. I mean, do you know without a doubt that when you die, heaven is your home? Has there truly been a point of conversion in your life? Maybe you've been here and this area of salvation has been bothering you. So if there's anyone here that has a question about their salvation, what's going to happen when they die? Say, Pastor, yes, that's me. I need you to pray for me. I, I'm, I just got a question or I'm not sure. Please pray for me. Just put your hand up where I can see it. Let me acknowledge it and you can put it right back down. Anybody here like that at all? I just see some small children. If you put your hand up, I missed it. I would need you to do it again. All right, Christian. We need some Stevens willing to make a difference. This man, as we come through Book of Acts, comes out of nowhere. Trust 
travel to Jerusalem. Here's the truth of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. You know what clicked in his brain? He knew this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. I cannot wait to sit down and talk with him in heaven. We need more Stevens. Father in heaven, bless this invitation, work in hearts and lives, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet.